So here we are one. My hope is the way we're going to work this is that um, we'll start every, every week with a time together like this. And then you'll see sheets in the middle of your table. Uh, you're going to grab two of those because they're collated out because my wonderful wife did that. Uh, you're going to want to grab those copies because we're going to go to breakout sessions. And those are discussion questions. You're going to get those every week. They're three hole punched because if you're an organized person, you can keep them. This is coming uh, one week at a time. At the end of the 14 weeks, you'll have uh, 13 of those lessons, basically, uh, that you'll have. And there are questions on there based on our chapter. And what we're going to do is we're going to break into small groups and we're going to talk about those questions. And then we'll come back together and we'll have a final large group discussion. And then uh, field any confusion or questions based on the discussions. Uh, but what I want to do every week is if it didn't get on the chat, were you confused by something? I want to start there, right, every week. So that's going to be our pace. Um, so before we get into the chapter, which is number four tonight, well, I'm going to ask it again. If I forget to ask, please remind me. If you're confused by something, I want to answer your question if I can. I don't want you to, to move along. So when we get to question four, you can ask your question. When we get to point four. So uh, tonight, I think it's important for you to, to get a little feel for who I am. So um, how many of you have met me for the first time tonight? OK. I. I am Tom Douglas. I grew up in a house that went to church. It was a very important thing. It was hard to miss that the church was an important place. We went every week. My mother and father are Mike and Kay Douglas. Um, maybe I refer to him as the cowboy hat and his wife. <laughs> uh, we went to church every week. I went to Sunday school. We did lessons at Sunday school. Um, I knew church and God and Jesus was an important thing. I would even tell you that I thought that the Bible was true, that I know who Jesus was. I probably could have answered just about any of the Sunday school questions. I knew that Jesus was the answer to every question in Sunday school. <laughs> even if the teacher said, what is, uh, what is short, legged, long, bushy tail, brown, runs up and down the tree, and eats nuts? You knew if you were in Sunday school, the answer was Jesus, <laughs> not squirrel. <laughs> so that was my experience. But all of that changed on May 4th, 1982. When my world and everyone that was close to me's world was rocked. Because on his way home from work, Mike Douglas smashed into a car and went up and over a stoplight. Harrison and 20th lit on his head, tore his lower leg off on his right leg. Um, he should have died multiple times. And what happens when you have intellectual relationship with Jesus? It doesn't last very long. And that was my experience. I experienced church going, but not Jesus. There's a difference between intellectual assent, knowing about and believing, and then there's trusting and putting your faith in Jesus. You see? So for me, it was like, there's a diff the, the way for me to illustrate the difference between intellectual faith that was just knowledge and truly putting my faith and trust in Christ is the difference between being at Niagara Falls, right? And there is a performer there, and they stretched a cable across Niagara Falls, and he's a high wire act. And he pulls out this wheelbarrow. And he says, do you think I can walk across the Niagara Falls with a wheelbarrow? And everybody goes, yes! I believe you can! True trust and faith means, okay then, climb in the wheelbarrow. I had a 
faith or a belief that was standing along the sides of the river going, I believe you can do it, but I never got in the wheelbarrow. You see what I'm saying? Because when you climb in that wheelbarrow, you're putting your faith and trust in something that's out of your control. How much do you really believe this? And are you going to go across that chasm by putting your faith and trust in that high wire act? Well, for me, it was Jesus. I mean, I knew intellectually. I, I believed that he was who he said he was. But I never got in the wheelbarrow. And May 4th, 1982 exposed that clearly. And I, I had no answer for how to live with a dad that I thought was Superman, but never imagined that I was going to a hospital room and he had tubes breathing for him. And they were giving him very little chance. He was rushed into surgery almost immediately because at the intersection, sitting at the intersection where his accident was, was an advanced paramedic unit. You know, that was just happenstance. That was just luck that that happened, you see. That was just luck. And they pulled around the corner, turned right, and pulled up, and immediately started giving advanced care. And they rushed into the hospital, and they put him under, and his blood pressure went to zero, because he bled out his entire blood volume into his internal cavity. He had a rip in his mesentery artery. And it was just happenstance that he didn't bleed out until he was on the table. See, it was just luck. It, was just ha it just happened that way. No, and it just happened that there was an advanced trauma surgeon who was about ready to leave for the day. And they called him back, and he didn't leave. And just in time, this advanced trauma surgeon started working on my dad. See, it was just luck. And that story got told time and time and time. These things just stacked up. These happenstances from where I was coming from. And my, lot, my life was rocked, and I didn't know what to do with it all. And so what I did was I went the opposite direction into rebellion. Because if this is what faith looks like, bad stuff happens, and I was going to church every week. If this is what it is, and I want no part of it. Because those are the kind of conclusions you arrive at when you've never been in the wheelbarrow. And so, for about a year and a half, I was never getting near that wheelbarrow. And so, came to one week where I had a buddy that I ran around with. My mom's in the audience. <laughs> who invited me to youth group because his mom was making him go. His name was Nick Rivers. Good buddy of mine. We escaped trouble together. <laughs> and so he's like, I don't want to go by myself. Would you go with me? I said, sure. Came here and was confronted by a group of students that didn't make sense to me. It was like they wanted to be there. And they were studying this book called Ephesians. I knew about Ephesians, but it was like it mattered what Ephesians said to them. It was different than what I'd experienced. And that's no condemnation to anything I'd experienced before, but I wasn't in the right place. And so I, I was confronted with genuine faith. Jeff Hansen was the youth pastor. Some of you may know Jeff. Through the being a part of that youth group, I put my faith and trust in Christ. I hopped in the wheelbarrow. That led to a cascade of choices in my life where I end up at Bethel, was called Bethel College back then. Now it's Bethel University, Christian college, majored in biblical and theological studies, got my undergrad degree in that, um, almost majored in psychology as well. I was one class short of a major. I think back about it, I'm like, you idiot. One class, but I didn't. Uh, got married after I finished college uh, to one of the girls in my youth group. Her name is Jeannie. She's my first wife. <laughs> We've been married for 33 years and a half, because half matters. <laughs> um, I went to seminary after college. I worked for a year. Jeannie went to seminary. <laughs> 
Yes, sir. <laughs> she was finishing her last year at Bethel while I worked, and then after she was done, we did go to seminary. I uh, went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois. My college professor that I TA'd for at Bethel helped me decide that because he said, hey, why don't you go to the seminary where all the books that you're going to read in any other seminary, the professors are there at Trinity. So go where the guys who are writing the books actually teach. So if you went to Bethel, you're going to use all these books, but all the professors were at Trinity. I said, great, let's go. And so we went there. And I worked on my Master's of Divinity. At the same time, I also worked on my PhD in Systematic Theology. I am an Albit Dissertation PhD student, and that's all the further I will ever be. <laughs> if any of you have done your PhD, oh. No, no, not going back. So then, I've uh, been in uh, ministry, um, organized and intentional church ministry since 1991. Uh, when we started seminary, we started at a little church in the south side of Chicago, Elam Baptist Church, and we've been in church ever since, and now we're here at Cross Point, at uh, this crossroads of our lives, and I'm thankful to be here. That's who I am. I want to talk a little bit about what some of my greatest fears are. Um, my greatest fear is, one of them is, if you don't know me, that you'll actually think that I know it all. I'm up here not because I know it all. If you've been around me at all, you'll understand I, I just have so much to learn. I'm, I think that the Christian life, no matter where you are, if you think you've arrived somewhere, that's a false summit. Look up. There's further to climb. The Holy Spirit's got more for you. No matter whether you are 20, 60, 80, 100, there's still more to learn. That's why you're here, I hope. But my fear is that you're going to look at me and go, well, he has all the answers. If I seem like that, then I'm doing a disservice. I don't have all the answers. But what I have is a passion to find the answers. And if we have a question that's hard for all of us, I want to learn together. It's selfish, really, for me that we are in this class because when you teach, man, do you learn. I learn so much when I'm asked to teach, and I'm responsible to, to serve us by presenting these chapters. And so this is a collective thing. Uh, if we come up with a hard question, I, I want to say I don't know, but I'll help. I'm, I'm going to try and find the answer, right? So my, my fear is, is that you think I have all, all the answers to the question. My second is around the question issue. My fear is that you won't <coughs> ask the question that you have. As if there's a dumb question, and that's why I was kind of joking about it earlier. My, my greatest fear is that one of you would come week in and week out with a question that you need to have answered, but you're, you think, well, it's a dumb question, or I already should know, you ever had that? I should already know this. I can't ask that question. I should already know this. I've been a Christian for 25 years. I've been a Christian for 60 years. No. Always ask the question. The shoulds is what the enemy wants to trap you with. He wants to trap you with, uh, with that. Well, you should already know this and shame you or guilt you about that. Remember I, at church I talked about Les when I was talking about this class? He was in his 70s when he and I met. He got over that. It was like this breakthrough for him. He's like, wow, I can really ask these questions? Yes. Yes, you can. And it, it, it opened up this opportunity for us to grow together. And when he would ask a hard question, it would be great, because then I'd have to learn the answer. And then we would grow together. And that's what I want out of this class, is for you to be able to ask those questions. Maybe your personality is you're quiet and you're introverted, and the last thing you want to do is ask the question. If you can't ask it in the group chat, you can ask it of me privately, and then it'll probably be a great question, and I'll want to say it out in front of everybody, but I won't tell them it was from you. But my fear is, is that you wouldn't ask that, and there would be a piece of, of knowledge or wisdom or growth that the Lord wants for you, that all you have to do to unlock that is to ask the question. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, my other fear is that you would think that this class is over your head as a result of not wanting to ask questions. It's not over your head. 
It's just fancy words a lot of the times. Because we pastors and, and uh, you know, academics like to sound smart. So we use terms like exegesis. It says exegesis over eisegesis. And we use terms like hermeneutics and sanctification and propitiation and a bunch of other terms. But my, I, I, I don't want anything to hold you back. And if, if, you, if you think you're not up to the task, forget about it. You are. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Yes. Then, then you do have what it takes. You have what it takes. And no matter where you are in your walk, no matter how many years you've walked with Jesus, you're going to catch something from this, this book that will absolutely sharpen you. It will, it will move you forward in your faith. And it will give you a greater confidence in handling God's word. Because my hope is, at the end of this, this is my target for you, okay? That you would be, number one, self-feeding. You know what that means? You have with confidence an ability to open the word and understand it. That you're going to get tools in your toolbox of, of Christian faith that you can use to open the pages of Scripture and, and be able to understand it better than you do today. So that you'd be, so you'd be self-feeding. You don't wait on anybody to help feed you. You don't have to wait on Pastor Dave and his sermons. <laughs> anybody that's ever been on Camera, you know what a tough guy he is <laughs> to follow. <laughs> Secondly, that you would not be easily deceived by false teachings. There are very subtle false teachings that are in church right now and today. There's a thing that continues to raise its head called health and wealth gospel or prosperity gospel. The name and claim it is another word for it. I'm sorry, but that's a lie from the pit. If, if, if God intended for you to be rich, what do you do about Jesus? That's, that's, that's my first question. And if your toes are being stepped on right now, good. <laughs> that's part of why I'm here is to step on toes. Because my toes are stepped on by Scripture too. So I want company. <laughs> Bottom line. So that you, could, you know why... Mormons are wrong when they have baptisms for dead people. Did you know they do that? It's a strange thing. They pull it out of a passage of scripture. Our first chapter kind of makes mention of it. And uh, did you know that Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe Jesus is God? It's an Ar it, Arianism is the name for that. It's a guy named Arius that had this whole theology that said, well, Jesus was a was a higher being, but he wasn't God. Or another way they say it is that you saw this physical Jesus, but that wasn't Jesus the God. Jesus the God was standing behind him in, in sort of a spiritual ghost that wasn't actually Jesus. It's weird stuff. And you, you're going to be able to know why that's a lie based on what scripture says. So you would be self-feeding, you would be able to tell false teachings right away. You will not be susceptible to something. And I'm hoping that if I'm up there preaching on Sunday or some morning, or Dave's up there and you hear him preach heresy, or you hear me preach heresy, or that's something that's not quite biblical, or you're not sure, you're like, wait a minute, I'm going to go ask him about that. I need clarification, because that doesn't quite sound right. That's the kind of Christian I want you to be. A, a little bit of inherent skepticism, and an ability to... Um, Sniff things out that aren't true and biblical. There's not enough of that in church. And we need wisdom where that's concerned. And, and that's going to come from knowing how to handle scripture. Right? So that's the second one. The third one is that you would be a multiplier of this teaching and of Christ. I, I want you to think in terms of who can I teach this book to after I'm done? And I'm not kidding. I think... Once we're done here, I know once we're done here, you can take this book and sit down with another person and say, let me take you through this book. This is amazing. Maybe it'll be somebody, I hope it'll be somebody here at Crosspoint because I'm selfish. I want everybody to get this book and understand how to do inductive Bible study and, and how to 
how to carefully understand what Scripture is saying. Um, so that, that's my third thing, and that's huge, is that you could turn around and teach it to somebody. It doesn't have to be super hard, because this book isn't super hard. I know it seems like it is, but it's really not, because we're going to do it together. Okay? Any questions about any of that? I knew you'd be afraid to ask questions. <laughs> so let's move on to why this class. Can, can I have some people look up in their Bibles? Oh, you didn't bring your Bible? You should always bring your Bible if you didn't. Pull out your device. Would somebody look up Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 for me? Raise your hand if you look up Ephesians 4. If, you got to be willing to read it out loud, I guess. So, if, if, okay, Ephesians 4. Okay, how about Matthew 27, 51? Matthew 27, 51. Got it back here, okay? Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. Got it? Okay, Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. Okay. So, God has called me, I believe, to be a part of fulfilling Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Who has that? Read it out loud for everyone, nice and loud. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the, pro the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So do you hear the, the like, this is not an exhaustive list of, of those people who are gifted in the church. But Paul's talking about a specific segment. Did you hear who they were? Apostles. What else? Um, prophets. Yeah. Evangelists. Evangelists. Pastors. Pastors. Teachers. Teachers. Okay. So this is, this is a specific group of people whose job it is to help do a specific job. And what did that job, did anyone catch it? What was the job specific to that passage? Equip God's people. Equip is the key word. Equip. I believe it's my job to help equip the saints. Guess who the saints are? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You, you and you and you and you. Saints, if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you are a saint. I know it doesn't feel like it sometimes. I get it. I have a mirror too. Okay? But I think it's my job to help equip you all to do stuff that other areas of Scripture says that has been prepared for you in advance. So the Christian life is actually a scavenger hunt. God has laid out this stuff for you to do for him in advance. It's just waiting for you to move on it. And all we have to do is look around and see what it is. And while we're doing that, we should be getting equipped, getting tools. You know, if you want to run a good marathon, you sit on your cha chair and watch football every week, right? <laughs> no. You're training. That's why Paul uses athletic imagery in his letters. Okay, so I think it's my job. I think that I'm doing specifically that by walking through this book. Okay, and uh, so that we're building up the church. Why do you need to do that? Matthew 27, 51, who has that? Yep. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split. Anyone that recognize where that came from? Jesus is hanging on the cross. He says, it is finished. He gives up his spirit. And then Matthew 27, 51 happens. And the curtain tore. And how did it tear? Which direction? Top to bottom. Top to bottom. Are you aware that the chances of that curtain being like a curtain hanging in your living room are slim and none? If you watched uh, Mel Gibson's version of the curtain tearing, it's like this little toy and it just... Oh no, that thing was thick. It was feet thick. Why? Because it was the curtain that was in between the people and the Holy of Holies. That kept people from accidentally falling into the Holy of Holies and dying. There was one man who could go in there one time a year to give uh, sacrifices for the people. And if he didn't go in in a worthy manner, he would die instantly upon going through the curtain. Going behind the curtain. That's why you've probably heard it said they would tie a rope around the person and would pull them back out if they died. 
because you couldn't go in after it. That was the way it was. Who has Hebrews? Hebrews, read the Hebrews passage. Oh, okay. It is Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Wait, wait, what? Where was that? We can enter the what? Holy places. Behind the curtain. We can do that now. Keep going. By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And who's the his? Sunday school. No, it's squirrel. It's squirrel. <laughs> yes, it's Jesus. Jesus, that tearing is the wrenching of Jesus. And he's died. that's another way that scripture is showing you what happened with Jesus' death. That his death was the way through into the Holy of Holies where you could only go once a year, and you could only go in a worthy manner, and if you didn't, you died immediately. Right? And that's Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, telling us what happened in Matthew 27, verse 51. And that means that no longer did there have to be one high priest, but there were, sec see, 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. Wait a minute, you're a holy what? Holy priesthood. Keep going, I'm sorry I interrupted, but I had to. <laughs> you're a holy priesthood who can offer up holy sacrifices. Did you catch that? It's no longer one guy once a year. It's no longer a priest. That's one or two guys in the, that you were born a Levite. Your family was Levite, so you could be a priest. Who's now a priest? The saints. And who are the saints? We are. That's all of us. One of the things that I think church has done a disservice to all of us, and the why for me is to break this down and you to understand that you are a priest. You bring sacrifices that are living sacrifices, Paul says in Romans 12. You're bringing living sacrifices. It's no longer sacrifice the animal and that's it. You are now a living sacrifice that continually brings praise and honor to God. That's who you are. If you, did, if you came in here not believing that, you know that the enemy's been lying to you. See, I told you. It's easy to believe lies, isn't it? And you just, right now, your spirit is trying to believe it, but then there's another side of you that's like, no, Tom, you don't know who I am. No, Jesus knows who you are. He met you. He made you again and fresh and new from your inside out. That's who you are. And why do I want to spend time with priests? Because you guys are going to get more and more dangerous every week. At the end of this, I'm going to say it again. You're going to be dangerous people. The enemy is going to take notice of you. He's going to look at you and go, uh-oh, I lost another one. Another casual Christian who just loves sitting and watching the world go by. They're dangerous to me. Who are they going after now? I better get after them. That's what I want for you. It's not just a study because I think it'd be cool to have a study. It's because I want you to be dangerous for Jesus. Because that's not just macho talk. And when when Dan read that it was brothers, it wasn't just brothers. It's brothers and sisters. We're all priests. Called to be kingdom priests by Jesus Christ. So basically, as we go through this book, um, you are going to learn, and you, if you have a place to write this down, this book is going to give you guardrails. Guardrails, write down the word guardrails. Basically, this book is going to give you guardrails. Why? Because we need them. Because the road gets slick. Because we, we, we slack or we lose attention. And we need guardrails. You know what guardrails do? They wreck your car a little bit rather than allowing you to wreck your car a lot. 
They're designed for you to wreck your car a little bit. It's got to have an ouch to it. This is going to give you guardrails on what you're allowed to believe and what you're not allowed to believe. And there's room in between those two guardrails, right? And there's room and there's space. There's differences in belief. But there's a certain point where, nope, not any further. The Bible says not any further. And what this book is doing is it's going to give us guardrails to know, wait, no, that's, that doesn't fit. That doesn't quite follow. I, I have to rethink this because my belief has to be changed by what Scripture says, not change Scripture according to what my belief should be. Boy, that happens way too often. And so chapter 1 starts talking about all this crazy stuff, man. It's like... Uh, the, the, the authors basically want you to be Acts 17 Christians. If you go to Acts 17, you'll see that Paul and Timothy and Silas are first in Thessalonica, I believe. And they go there and they have to escape because there are so many uh, bad actors in Thessalonica. They, they go after Paul and they run him out of town. You know where he goes next? A little town called Berea. And in Acts 17, I think I wrote my note here, Acts 17, verses 10, and 10 through 12, it talks about when Paul goes to Berea and he starts preaching the word. And you see these Bereans understand guardrails. Because as you read verses 10, 11, and 12, the text says that they uh, search the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Do you see their awareness of guardrails? So basically, they were taking, which at this time was the Old Testament, they were taking the Old Testament and they were looking at what Paul was teaching and they were comparing what Paul was teaching to what the scriptures said. Because they were aware that scripture was their guardrail. And they tested it against what the Bible said. That's what I want for you. That you hear something that even taught here, even taught by someone like that shifty guy, Rick Bavell. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> Test what he teaches you. Make sure he's teaching you the truth about what Hebrews says. Is he really telling you the truth about what Scripture is saying there in Hebrews? Mm -hmm. Well, look at the rest of Scripture make sure it squares. And you're going to learn how to do that as we go through this, this book. Because you want you to be Berean Christians. And so um, the first chapter basically opens up and starts talking about how to interpret the Bible. I've got my hat on right now, and it's, somebody thought it was Michael's hat. It's not. It's just, it's just like his hat. It says exegesis over eisegesis. Anybody recognize the word exegesis? That's from, the, that's from the chapter one. We'll get to that. Hang in there. But it starts talking at the first part of the chapter about interpreting. And you know what it accuses you of? It accuses you of being an interpreter. Did you see that? It says, look, if you read the Bible, you're, you're interpreting. Did you notice that it said if you read a translation, you're reading an interpretation of what the original language says? Yes. Your translation, your English translation, whatever one you use, is an interpretation of the original language. So you're already dealing with an interpretation. And what it's basically trying to say is, it's a fact. You interpret every time you read the Bible. Whether you admit it to yourself or even aware of it, you're interpreting. So be careful how you interpret. Is it possible to interpret? Yeah. Is it possible to interpret wrongly? Whew. But how many of us have been confronted by scripture and we, we leave scratching our head. Have you ever had that? What did that mean? What did Paul mean that women are saved through childbirth? You ever read that passage? You know what that verse means? Let me tell you, I have no clue. <laughs> but I have my first recommendation to you of a book. As you're going through scripture, if you find a hard saying, here's a book called Hard Sayings of the Bible. <laughs> One of the authors that put it together is Walt Kaiser. I had him as a professor at Trinity. 
amazing man. He's now, he, I used to say he was at Gordon Conwell. Um, I will post this as one of our resources, a link to this book. Uh, but you don't need to buy it if you don't, if you don't want to get it, because this is actually out of Pastor Dave's. I have a copy of it, but it's in a box in my house and, and not, not to be unpacked yet. <laughs> my copy is buried. I don't know where it is, but Dave was kind enough to let me bring it out here so I can hold it up for you. I'm sure he would let you borrow this. Because if you go in here, you can read that passage based on where it is in Scripture about women being saved through childbirth, and they'll give you kind of some, some more understanding about that verse. So if you've ever been stumped by a passage, that's a great resource. Plus, the context around it can help you with it. But we'll, we'll get more into that as we go through the book. So it's, it, it basically says, look, everybody's an interpreter. There is a plain meaning. You know what the plain meaning means? The original author's meaning. The plain meaning, whenever it says that, is the original author's meaning. Now, have you ever heard somebody use the term plain meaning and then they start telling you some false teaching? Like the, the book cites a couple of, of the false teachings, right? What are, what are one of them that they, that they go through? I can't, was it, uh, it's, I think it's prosperity gospel. Like, you know, God wants everybody to be rich. Well, everybody, he wants everybody to be rich in him. But uh, again, what do you do with Jesus if he's supposed to have everybody? The guy never had a, a dime to his name. He even had one of his disciples ripping off the, uh, the, the bank account as they were walking around Judea. You know? Ended up betraying him for more money. So, false teachings, right? So there, there's, there's plain meaning, and if it's so plain, why are there all these different beliefs? Well, sometimes differences in beliefs are still within the guardrail, okay? Is somebody not a Christian if they believe in Catholicism? No. I, I know I went through life, my sister is, is Catholic, she loves Jesus like crazy. <coughs> A long time I thought, if you're a Catholic, it meant you were almost a Christian. <laughs> when I went to Bethel College, Dan Bruin blew that belief up in my life. He was a passionate Catholic who loved Jesus, who had spiritual gift of tongues, and he was a Catholic. What? <laughs> you know, you get these guardrails that you think are there, but they're not. So there's, there's plain meaning that we can think differently about, but it's still inside the guardrails. Just because somebody believes in infant baptism, that's one that they talk about. Okay? Just because you believe in infant baptism doesn't make, mean you're disqualified as a Christian. That's not outside the guardrail. And so plain meaning can have different understandings, but there are plain meanings that are outside of the guardrails they talk about, like... Mormon baptisms for the dead and stuff like that. So it talks about those plain meetings and it talks, some, did some pretty good um, discussion on how we can misunderstand plain meaning. Did you catch that one about the cross? Yes. Yeah, it's not this, it was actually that. Yeah. Not this, but that. So it's, I don't know how you'd cross yourself then, but you'd have to stay down here because the cross... Yeah, that was, it was probably a T. And Jesus didn't carry the whole thing. It was probably just the cross timber. So it was just the top of the T that he carried. But it was probably like this. Big. Two foot by two foot. Not light. And they would pull that up on the top. And it would set over posts that would keep it in place. And that's how they'd stay there. Right? So the plain meaning of the text isn't as plain as we thought it was. We could, we could be misunderstanding the text if we're not careful. And I want you to be Bereans. I want you to be careful. Exegetes, meaning you know the original meaning and you've done your work. Right? So it goes there. So um, it's interesting because did you catch the eternal relevance with the historical um, particularity? That's that's fancy term for saying... There's something that's eternal that the scripture shares, but it happens in a real time, in a real place. 
When you're reading the book of Romans, it's a real guy writing to a group of people that he hopes to see. When you read the book of Ephesians, well, that was a circular letter, so let's just say in Philippians, there was a church in Philippi, and Paul is writing to that church. When you read Corinthians, there was really this place called Corinth, and there was a church there, and he wrote bunches of letters to them. So it happened in a real time, in a real place. Uh, Christianity, I like to say, um, is in the dirt, right? You can verify it. Archaeology will back it up. You can go to Corinth and find that there was a church there. You can go to Ephesus, and there's evidence of church, right? So, so it's real places, and so there's these eternal truths that are being told in the midst of corresponding letters. You know? Do you correspond with anybody today? That's not email? <laughs> that you write it? My daughter Sadie writes a letter almost every day. A real, honest to goodness letter to friends and family. And that's how God used those letters by Paul writing to include in his, in his scripture to teach us. But that's not the only kind. There's these things called Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Saucy. <laughs> and Genesis and Exodus. And there's all these different kinds of uh, books in the, in the Bible. More than 14 different genres. There's poetry. There's narrative. There's um, wisdom sayings like Proverbs. There's epistles like all the Ians that, that Paul wrote. There's gospels, four of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all different kinds. And so what do we do with all of this? That these things have been landed in historical time and place, but they're telling us eternal truths. And we need to know how to handle that. What, how do we determine what this Bible meant when it was originally written? And the author basically says, um, you have contexts to work with. And, and contexts are a part of exegesis. Did you see that exegesis is one of the main headings? No. All, all exegesis means is that you're pulling from the text. Exegesis literally means ex meaning out of, pulling from, and then the text is the, is the Jesus part, or genosis. Never mind, just trust me. <laughs> that it means pulling from the text. You're listening to what the text has to say. You're drawing your conclusions based on what the text says. But then, as my hat says, there's a wrong way to do it. It's called eisegesis. It means putting into the text. I have an agenda. I want to convince you of it. I have a, a spiritual Ponzi scheme that I want to convince you of. So I have to find places in scripture that I can make sound like what I want. That's how you get misinterpretation of scripture. You read into the text. Do we want to read into the text? No. We want to pull from the text. Do we read into the text regularly? Yes. That's why we're here. We have to, we have to get sniffers of that and figure out where we're doing it. When we have a particular theology, we start reading texts looking for our theology. If you think, once saved, always saved, and you start going to scripture looking for once saved, always saved scriptures, you're going to find them everywhere. It's just like when you buy a car and you think, I've got this cool car, nobody has one. And they start driving around. <laughs> Wait, there's one, and there's one, and there's one, and there's one. And everybody has a Toyota Tundra now. That's what I drive. <laughs> You start seeing your own, you ever notice that? It's like, wow, there's that coming all over the place. You do the same thing when you start looking at scripture to, to confirm your theology. And I'm not saying once saved, always saved is wrong. I'm just saying that's an example of a theological position that people tend to go and look for. And they'll discount passages that seem to contradict that. Like Hebrews. Contradicts a little bit of that. What do we do with that? Got to figure out how to hold those in tension because the scripture is saying two things. So what do we do with that? We have to 
come underneath the text is basically what exegesis does and say, what does the original meaning mean? You have to look carefully at those things. And so exegesis basically is pulling from the text. It's looking at the time and place. Why did Paul write those things in Ephesians like he did? Women, you're not allowed to speak. Do you ever speak in church? Huh. So you're breaking scripture, huh? Do you, do you wear makeup and jewelry? Paul's pretty clear about that as well. Uh-oh. We, we have to understand why we should be careful about those things, right? If we, if we understood the context within what was going on in Ephesus and their surrounding communities, there was something going on that was problematic with the way females were behaving in church. So what do we do with that? We need to be careful about how we talk about that. With anything we say, we need to be consistent. We need to make sure that it's not beyond the original meaning, which the, the book really makes a big deal out of, right? Whatever we believe about something, it can't be something other than what they believed the first, when it was first written, right? So that's, that's one of those guardrails from exegesis. We learn about context. We learn about why certain things are written the way they are. You know why the, the uh, book of Genesis versus uh, chapters 1 and 2 are written the way they are? Chap chapters 1 and 2 are all about creation. Okay, it was, the, it was morning, it was the evening, it was the first day. Does that sound familiar? You know what that is? That's poetry. You know why it's written the way it is, morning and evening the first day? Because when Moses was writing, it was an oral culture. And the best way to remember things is to have a beat to them. And that's poetry, there's rhyme, there's rhythm to, to talking about how God created. God created in a way that, that was perfect and organized and intentional. And Moses wanted you to know that. He wanted you to know that that there is nothing that you can experience that God didn't create. He created it with a word out of nothing. And how can you remember that? By giving it rhyme and rhythm. Think about it. Doesn't music or poetry help you remember things? Yeah. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, What's next? Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Provide for the common defense. Promote the general welfare and... It's a preamble to the Constitution. Set to song. I'm 56 years old and I still remember it because it was put to song in a little Saturday morning cartoon known as... Schoolhouse Rock. The Junction, Junction, what's your function? Come on! That was why Moses wrote it the way he did. He wasn't trying to tell you every little jot and tittle of how God created. He wanted you to come away knowing that God created and that you would be absolutely confident that God created everything and he created you. That's what exegesis could do for you. Isn't that cool? It's just amazing because if you're a little kid and you're learning this poetry, you know, and it's like my kids can sing almost all of that uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, musical because it's all this stuff set to, to rhyme and it's, it's like amazing. It's exactly why Moses did it. So that's what we can figure out when we start using exegesis as our friend. We understand the historical context and we can come away with a deeper understanding of why and how it was written. Um, and there's a little saying that I want to leave with you, and I'm going to talk about hermeneutics really quick, and then we're going to break into small groups. So any text without a context is a pretext for heresy. <laughs> any text without a context is a pretext for heresy. Any text without a context is a pretext 
for heresy. Heresy means absolutely outside of the guardrails belief. It means wrong belief. And so exegesis keeps us from that. It makes us look at what happens when, when Paul says, you know, in Romans 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, metamorphosized. You ever seen metamorphosis happen? Chrysalises turn, help butterflies turn from caterpillars to butterflies. That's Paul, that's coming within a context of Romans. Why does he start talking about that in chapter 12? Well, I'm not going to give you the answer. <laughs> but it's, I'll tell you what, it's in the flow of his argument that he's making in Romans. And it's the perfect move. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that Verse 2, you are living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That's my good news for you. And when we're talking about hermeneutics, hermeneutics is a fancy term again. When it finishes with hermeneutics, it's just a fancy term that means how to properly apply Scripture to today. Hermeneutics basically just means a fancy term on how to properly apply Scripture today so that we don't pull it out of context, we don't make it mean something that it could never have meant, but we apply it appropriately, principally. You take the principle that scripture teaches and you properly and carefully apply it. And basically, as we go through these, these chapters week after week, it's going to give you how to do that in different areas of scripture. So next week we're going to talk about what? Does anyone know? Look in your table of contents. A good translation. By the time next week we're, we finish Wednesday night, you're all going to go out and buy a new living translation. <laughs> no, but you're going to be able to use the new living translation along with several others that are really good, like NASB, like ESV, like NIV 84 version, or 20, 2011, I think it is. Berea, um, that was a brand update. We're going to use those translations. We're going, to, we're going to learn about how to make a good translation. And then we're going to move into various parts of Scripture after that. Each chapter gives you this great way to deal with each area of Scripture. And it's exciting because it gives you guardrails for how to read the Gospels. It gives you guardrails on how to read a historical narrative in the Old Testament. It gives you guardrails on, on how to read wisdom literature like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and, and all those wisdom passages, right? It gives you those guardrails on how, how do I handle this when I'm reading this kind of a book that you don't maybe have yet. And they're just more tools in your toolbox, and they're just more things that are going to make you dangerous to the enemy. I'm guaranteeing it. Because you're going to know how to hold your scripture open and go, oh, I get it now. And so I want to stop talking, and um, I want everybody to, if you can, if you can stand up, and grab your uh, book uh, questions that will end up being a booklet. Take a copy of those with you. Um, who's willing to go down to across the hall to the library here? Which table? Let's see. Let's do, okay, that back table over there. Uh, and, and then you guys want to join that back table there and go to the library. Okay. Um, Let's see, would you guys be willing to go into the room that's right behind this wall? Yeah. There's a table in there, okay? Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, we, we can have a, who, who's got, like, would rather not walk somewhere because it's hard to get around? Anybody? <laughs> so maybe you guys want to stay right here. Uh, that back table, you want to go into that back corner over there? This table, we're going to go in the back corner over there. Turn lights on for yourselves. I can do that here, maybe. I don't know how they turn on. Yeah, I'm going to move this, this group right here. She's helping me out. So you guys know where the bridal room is? If you go straight through this wall to the hallway, you guys can use that room as a breakout. Use the questions to uh, discuss together. Okay? Those questions will guide your discussions. 
I would take your book. Yeah, you guys can go. Maybe you guys can go with them. Is that okay to go to the bridal room? To the bridal room. That's not the one right next door. No, it's, it's on the other side of the hallway, where my wife was getting ready. It's in between the two bathrooms. Yep. The lights are on. The door is open. Be back at eight o'clock. We'll be back at eight o'clock. Would you guys? Okay.